So what I kind of want to talk about today um, kind of stems from a conversation that I had on the way home from uh, my last college basketball game. So, you know, um, we played in the UMAC championship, uh, conference championship in Mankato against Bethany Luther. Um, we lost by six. Heartbreaking game. We were down by like 24 with 11 minutes left. Came all the way back, cut it to two, and just uh, just missed a shot to you know make it close. But um, it was so fun playing for Northwestern and playing with a group of guys that um, love the Lord as well. Um, having that experience was outside of this world. Like you know, I came from a public school, so not everyone you know either believed in God or even was like uh, it didn't even like. Um, have a faith necessarily, but um, coming to a place where everyone has the same faith as you, it, it's kind of amazing. And um, the bus rides were probably some of the funnest parts about college basketball, if I'm being honest, because when you get down with the game, you know, you finally can relax and you just start joking around. I mean, there's times where we would be running along this bus, we get a charter bus, and we'd be running along the bus, and like people would gang up on other people and start tickling them, like on this like six hour bus ride. So you have people squirming all over the place. You have people yelling at each other. It gets crazy, but, so we're coming back. It's the last time I'm ever gonna get to ride on a bus with this group of guys. And you know, I've been with these people for three, two, three years, you know, quite a while. And um, we started arguing like, what food is better than what food, you know? Cause we argue a lot about pointless things. Like, no, Chick-fil-A is way better than Cane's. Like, stuff like that. <laughs> Stuff that doesn't even really matter because it's all personal preference. That's like me getting mad at Pastor Jim because his favorite color is green. It's like, no, it's got to be red, Pastor Jim. Like, so we argue like that. But uh, eventually we got to the uh, discussion about uh, the billion dollar question. Um, so it was like doing, asking a bunch of questions like, oh, what would you do for a billion dollars? Oh, what would you do for a billion dollars? So like the first question was, would you eat like a bucket of horse poop? For like a billion dollars and like stuff, stuff foolish like that and, or like or like pant someone in public in front of like the entire country or some, something foolish like that I mean I'm gonna be honest for a billion dollars a bucket of poop I mean I feel like I could just squeeze that down <laughs> a billion dollars that's a lot of money ladies and gentlemen. that's a, that's a thousand million dollars that's all I'm saying. I said I could, I could probably tough through for a billion dollars if it, if it was a buck of a horse poop. And, and a lot of guys agreed with me on that one. But then, <laughs> then it started getting like super deep and started being like these deeper questions for like a billion dollars. And one of them eventually came up as would you sin for a billion dollars? But like you could choose the sin. So it's like it could, it could be just like lying or you know, something like it could be like just want, like what we consider a simple sin, you know. But like, would you sin for a billion dollars? And so, you know, we go to a school where, you know, we're all Christians. So we're, uh, our initial reaction was like, no, no, not a chance. Like, that was our initial reaction. But then as we started like talking about it and thinking about it, like, maybe like we were like checking our hearts. Like, would there be something that like we'd be okay sinning for a billion dollars? Because, you know, like I said, that's a lot of money. And a lot of people are like, man, I could do... A lot of things with a billion dollars. I could do a lot of good with a billion dollars too. Like you could, you know, give to charity or, you know, like help a lot of people. And so that's kind of another thing that I love about my team is we challenge each other spiritually that way. It's the, it comes in the weirdest forms. Like I would never expect talking about eating horse poop to, you know, challenge myself spiritually. But um, as, as like we went along and we started questioning ourselves, it's like, you know, it'd probably be a lot harder than we think to say no, instead of just the initial, oh, of course not. But if you have a billion dollars sitting there staring you in the face, if you're really checking your heart, you might be like, man, that, that's tough. So um, it kind of made me think uh, um, of a question. It's like, am I satisfied by worldly things or things of like this earth? And it made me think of a song that I... Oh, Appreciate it. It made me think of a song that I had been listening to, um, like over the course of this time, called Satisfied. And it's by this Christian rapper, he's from London, his name's S.O., if you ever want to look him up. And like the chorus of the song is, only Christ can truly satisfy. Can truly satisfy. Now, we all know we have physical needs, and you know, we need to be, like, we need to breathe, we need to, you know, do certain things, our bodies have to function in a certain way, and 
we need food and stuff like that to satisfy our physical needs. But does God satisfy our our spirit and our like our happiness necessarily? Like to use a, a lesser term. And so that's what it kind of made me think of, and that's what we kind of like started to talk about is, you know, are we are like is our happiness based solely on what God is doing for us, and are we truly satisfied by God, or like if something that great came along, would we be be like Oh, I think I can be satisfied by that. But, like, one thing I also want to point out is that, you know, God still has grace and still has mercy on us. So, like, saying if we did sin, um, it's not like we were saying, oh, that one sin is the reason why we're not in heaven. We could still ask for forgiveness for that. But at the same time, we don't want to sin, correct? So that's kind of the reason why we were, like, wrestling with this question is, do we truly, are we truly, truly satisfied by what God does for us? And so, what it started making me think of was the Israelites in the desert with uh, Moses and I believe Joshua. It is. And so, um, in Exodus 16, it's like, I'm only, it's, the whole passage is like really, really long, like you guys have probably read it. But it's when um, God provided the quail and the manna for the Israelites in the desert. So, I'm just going to read a little, just like a couple verses of it, and then give like a summary of it. Or else we're going to be here all day listening to me read from the book. Just like fold it open. So I'm just going to read verses 2 through 5 real quick. So it says, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they, as they gathered on the other day. So, the Israelites are complaining, saying, God, you just basically brought us up into the de desert to starve, you know? Like... Like, why'd you do that? Like, how, how do we know we're even going to make it out of here alive, basically? And so, when I was thinking about, like, does Christ satisfy us, I was thinking, like, these people were complaining that, you know, they weren't getting their earthly stuff to satisfy instead of just putting their faith in and trusting God and saying, God will provide for us, you know, and trusting that God will satisfy the needs that we have physically but also spiritually. And now that's a lot easier said than done. I mean, if we were all Israelites... We had just been enslaved for hundreds of years by the Egypt. We had just now come out. We had never even really heard of God, except for what Moses has really told us. You know, So we, we hadn't really had like a huge faith to begin with. And now we're out in the desert, away from slavery, and there's no food, no nothing, anything like that. It probably, we'd probably be complaining a little bit too. It'd be hard like, not to you know, complain and be like, God, why are you doing this to us? You know, because this is all so new to us. You've just been brought out into the desert away from your whole, everything you've known, like everything that you've been accustomed to, 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 this, to the desert where there's no food, no nothing. And so now I'm going to skip ahead. So then, well, let me summarize then, going up to what I'm going to do. So then, um, so God then brings down the meat and the bread, and they have, all have enough for... <laughs> You know, the six days, and he said, on the sixth day, I'll give you twice as much so that you don't have to do it on the Sabbath. And um, some people, so actually after the first day, people gathered it, but then they were supposed to eat it all in one day. So you're supposed to take it, gather it, and eat it all in one day, and then have nothing left over, because then the next day, he's going to provide again. And so the first night, I believe some people kept some of theirs, thinking, oh, I'll have extra in the morning. But then when they woke up, there was all rotted and there's maggots and everything like that. And so they did this for six days and then the seventh day they had twice as much. But I'm going to skip ahead here to um, verse 17 and 18 here. And it says, The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they had needed. So, we're in the desert. We're thinking, you know, we have no food, no nothing. And then God provides all of it. 
And even the people who didn't gather as much as, you know, so say this family didn't gather as much as this family, they still had everything they needed, and they still had everything they needed to a T. Like, not too much, not too little. No matter, no matter how much they gathered. And so, it was think, I was thinking, so like, okay, God satisfied the Israelites in the desert when there was no food, no water, no nothing, and he gave them all, everything that they needed. So, um, hold on, I want to figure out where I'm going here. Um, so I was like, so why do I, why am I satisfied by earthly things when I know that in a way harder circumstance than mine, God still satisfied the needs of the Israelites and the needs of his people. And a lot of times, we don't really know what it like kind of looks like to be satisfied in Christ. Or we don't really, you know, think about, oh, and if everything went wrong today, would I still be satisfied in Christ? And we have to kind of take steps towards that and think, okay, if I'm not in this position, which we're not all going to be spiritually perfect. That's not what I'm saying here. We never will be until we can go be with God. Um, how do we get to a place where we can say, you know, no, God truly satisfies me. And no matter what happens on this earth, I'm still going to be truly satisfied in him. And it brought me back to a quote that I heard from another song. As you guys can tell, I listen to a lot of music. Um, and it said, holiness comes before happiness. And... So when I thought of that, a lot of people are like, what? You're telling me I can't be happy ever? And it doesn't say holy, holiness, not happiness. It says holiness before happiness. That's like saying your holiness is going to lead to your hap to happiness. But you have to have holiness with God first. And so there's no absence of the happiness. It's not just saying we're just going to trudge along in life and just be miserable and just hate everything because we're trying to live a holy life. No, God is going to satisfy you, satisfy the needs, not only physically, but spiritually as well. And he'll, and he'll bring, you'll find happiness and true joy when you're seeking to be holy. Now that's a lot easier said than done. I mean, we all know that we're not perfect human beings and we can't, and we're not all holy, not perfectly holy. So it needs to be a daily thing. So we all think that every time we're going to take on this task, and actually a lot of times when I'm talking to people about basketball, they're, they're always looking for like this magic pill to become really good at basketball. Like, oh, if I, if I do this one drill, I'm going to be amazing tomorrow. But that's not how it works. Nothing in life is going to work that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to upset people here if that's how you think it works. But there's no magic pill on how to get from being good at something overnight. It, take, it takes daily work. It takes going again and again and constant, like, well, in basketball, it takes work day in and day and day and day and day. And, like, if you think, look at the professionals or anybody, any musician, anybody else who's mastered what they've done, they haven't done it, they haven't done this magical drill for, like, two days and then been, you know, the, the best at what they do. They've had to work at it day and day and day and day again. And that's kind of like what we do with our spiritual life as well. We daily have to come to God with our, with our prayers, with our needs, and our spiritual needs. You know, We can't do this on our own. We, we constantly have to say, God, I need you to satisfy my spirit and the things that I need. Because what happens when we try to do it on our own? It don't work. We, we're going to want to sin for the billion dollars then. The thing that we said we don't want to do in the first place. So it just ends up coming full circle. So um, God is truly all we need to be satisfied. And a lot of times we don't think that that's true. Or like we'll, we'll say, yeah, of course, like we'll say it. But do we truly believe that, that that is true? Do I truly believe that God is going to satisfy every need that I had and also my spiritual needs in him? And I'm not telling you guys that we're going to be perfect tomorrow or that you guys are going to be a master of this tomorrow. I'm not saying that, oh, today, you know, I like, I, I told myself, like, okay, after I get this message, uh, I'm going to be totally satisfied in God now. No. I'm still going to have to go the next day and the next day and the next day to continually to come to God and say, I need you to help me get to where I need to be. And I need your help 
like like the, the song we we're singing, not by might, not by power. It's not by our might and our power that we're just going to be truly satisfied with God. We have to put an effort. We have to put an effort, no doubt. But if but it's not by our might and our power. So that's why we need His Holy Spirit to come do that for us. And so um, I want to read Philippians 4, not 13, 19. Everyone, everyone knows Philippians 4, 13. I hope. I haven't seen bad books. So Philippians 4, 19, it says, And God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So, I know this wasn't a super long message, but I don't really want to drag it out on you guys. I just kind of want to get the point across. So, Kind of in closing, I just want us to think, is Christ enough to satisfy us as a whole community, as a church, but is he also enough to satisfy us individually? And I think when we truly sit there and ask ourselves this question, we, we can see maybe, like, we can see where we're going to need to go and where we're going to need to ask God to help us so that we can be truly satisfied in him. And um, you know, if we're not satisfied in Him, that's when we got to start putting our holiness before our happiness. Because a lot of times we'll put our happiness before our holiness. And that just leads to what we think is happy. And the thing is that sometimes we don't just put our happiness before holiness, we put other people's happiness before holiness, our holiness. We're like, oh, I want to make this person happy. Oh, I want to satisfy their needs and make them happy. Whereas we still have to put our holiness and the holiness in general ahead of happiness. And when we do that, we're going to start to see that we're going to be truly more satisfied with what God has for us. And the promises that He's given us, He's promised us so many things. Like when you look back and read at what He's promised us, it's amazing. Yes. It gives us such a confidence to, to walk around and proclaim Him to other people that it's unbelievable. You know? And so, what, so, what I hope that like we start to take on is that we're going to start to be truly satisfied in Christ. But not overnight. Like I said, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a daily task of say, making the decision to put holiness before your happiness. And sometimes that might not always be the easiest and best decision. Trust me. I failed at this before. Not, not, I'm sure all of us can say that we probably failed at this before. You know? But we can still consciously, that's what forgiveness is for though. That's what our faith is based on. It's forgiveness that knowing that when we do mess up in that, that we, God still loves us and still says, you know what, I still love you and I'm still going to forgive you of this. And I'm going to forgive and forget. He doesn't keep records of wrongs. I think it's in one of the Gospels where it says he keeps no records of wrongs. Like, can you think of that? Like, he knows everything. Everything. He knows when you're going to blink. He knows the next time you take a deep breath or when you're going to sleep or when you're brushing your teeth. And yet he keeps no records of the wrongs that we have done against him when we've asked for, for his forgiveness. That's amazing. So, are we going to be satisfied in, in what Christ has done for us and what there, he is currently doing for us? But it can't start unless we don't have a relationship with Him. We first have to have a relationship with Him. We have to know Him. Because you can't, you can't be satisfied by something you don't know. Like, I can't be satisfied with some really good cooking from somewhere else if I don't know about it. So we first have to know Him and have, start having a relationship to say, God, I need you just to satisfy me. He'll satisfy you physically, but we also want to be satisfied spiritually. 